welcome. Welcome here uh, today uh, to one of the uh, lectures in our uh, New York Institute of Technology School of Architecture lecture series, Future by Design. Uh, today we have uh, uh, an incredible le uh, lecture that will uh, tell us a little bit about uh, not only the future but also the the past and how we uh, can uh, we can project that into the future. Uh, this lecture is uh, well. First of all, I want to thank the lecture and event committee uh, that supported uh, myself and all the history and theory of architecture uh, teaching cohort. Um, for the organization of this lecture, uh, especially Yunte Yun, which is the coordinator of the History and Theory Program, uh, that uh, isn't with us today, but he's uh, uh, supporting this event. Uh, I thank Sue and the rest of the Lecture and Events Committee uh, for um, their support. Um, and uh, I thank all the students, uh, first year um, architecture and interior design students that are here today to attend this lecture, which is part of their, um, their curriculum. Uh, this lecture is indeed part of the um, um, introductory history and theory of architecture and design course. Uh, so we are very exciting uh, to open this up uh, to the New York tech community, but also uh, the rest, <laughs> the rest of all the guests are interested in uh, um, in learning more about conservation as representation. So um, uh, the guest uh, that we uh, have today with us is Javier Ors Osin, and uh, he is a an architect from Spain and a program manager at the World Monuments Found here in uh, New York, uh, where he oversees. Uh, per, uh, three thematic programs that focus on modernism, Jewish heritage, and crisis response. Um, he um, has presented his fieldwork and research extensively uh, as uh, he has a background in critical conservation from Harvard Graduate School of Design, uh, but he also has a, a master uh, in architecture from the Universidad Politecnica de Valencia in Spain. Um, he has um, not only presented his work, but also research uh, in various important international venues. Uh, so we're very excited to have him here. I will not say much more about him because I asked him to speak about his career path and his uh, journey uh, up until now uh, with and share it with, with you, with, with the students. So please, um, an applause for Javier. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello, everyone. Um, well, first of all, thank you, Francesca, for the introduction and for the invitation. And thank you, Susan, for all the help uh, with the logistics and to really make this happen today. And I guess also thank you to the history and theory uh, program uh, for you know helping or supporting uh, kind of the, the lecture today and kind of the fact that I'm here. Um, so I, today, my goal, uh, I've prepared what I think is a long lecture, uh, so I hope it will be of interest to you, but my goal today is to, in a way, walk you through the field of heritage conservation um, through a few case studies uh, and through the work of World Monuments Fund, which is an, the organization where I work. So that you can really understand, you know, in a way it's an introduction, I guess, uh, how the field has evolved uh, from a very kind of material uh, conservation focused to an approach today that also involves a more um, human approach and that really fosters community engagement and participation and bringing other voices and narratives uh, when it comes down to preserving cultural heritage, architectural heritage. Um, and I guess as a first point, as Francesca said, I'm just gonna introduce myself. Francesca already did it, uh, but I will just get into a bit more detail um, because I, assume uh, all of you are students of architecture and I was a student of architecture many years ago or a few years ago um, in Spain. And I think it's interesting to see that, you know, when you are a student of architecture and if you are interested in working in an architecture firm, uh, that's a path that you can take, but there are alternative paths, professional paths uh, that I think architects should be more involved in uh, that involve also um, 
it seems that there is someone in the waiting room in Zoom. I don't know if I would you take care of that. Um, and that also involves fields like heritage preservation, and but also heritage preservation working in organizations like World Monuments Fund, which is not an architecture firm, but uh, an international NGO that works really implementing a very diverse type of projects that really foster kind of social and econo economic development. So as again, as Francesca said, I am an architect. I studied architecture in Spain, um, a six year uh, master's degree which is a professional degree. You are fully a licensed architect after you graduate. I practiced for a few years. I was always very interested in kind of heritage conservation, but uh, as I started practicing, I was more and more interested in questions that also related not only technical uh, questions of how to restore a building, but also uh, questions of representation, of uh, under-representation, uh, like whose heritage we are preserving, whose heritage is really being labeled as heritage and what heritage is not uh, being labeled as heritage, questions of conflict in the built environment. Um, and that in a way led me to the master in design studies uh, with a focus on critical conservation at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard, uh, because it really, that master was really an opportunity to, um, it, it really creates a platform uh, for students to bring ideas uh, that connect to cultural heritage and heritage preservation, but through the lens of questions of identity, representation, culture, uh, power dynamics, again, who controls what sites are preserved and what sites are labeled or landmarked as heritage. And it was, you know, a great uh, experience. Uh, I was at the GSD for two years. And after I graduated, I started working at World Monuments Fund. I was very lucky to have the opportunity to join this team uh, because, as I was saying before, World Monuments Fund is an international NGO, uh, nonprofit organization that implements uh, conservation, heritage conservation projects around the world. And when I say heritage conservation projects, I mean projects that involve the physical restoration of sites, but also projects that involve, involve policy, advocacy, documentation, conservation planning, um, building capacity and training, uh, working with local schools uh, to train younger generations of architects uh, in skills and tools uh, of uh, heritage conservation, conservation planning. So it really is a, an amazing organization in my opinion. And you also get to use you know, your creativity and design thinking uh, but also get to learn so much about many other uh, places and communities that um, you didn't know before. So I, be, I feel very privileged for that. And um, with that, oops. Yes. Uh, just uh, to provide a bit more background on World Monuments Fund, um, we are headquartered here in New York. Um, this is where the organization was created in the US. Uh, although we work internationally, and in fact, we have five affiliate offices in Peru, Spain, Portugal, the UK, and India. And also we have um, staff, members of our team who are based in other parts of the world to really uh, identify projects and needs and you know, really help us to articulate new projects and support local governments, communities who are in need of financial support, uh, skills, professional support to uh, conduct conservation projects. So while we are really based in New York, we are truly global in our team and staff. And you know these offices that you see here in a way might look like they are uh, spread around the world in a kind of random way because it's only Peru, Spain, Portugal, the UK and India. But this really reflects kind of our history, how you know throughout the years, there were parts of the world where we have so much work uh, that it was important for us to have an office there to really uh, make connections, work with the local governments, ministries of culture, and, and really have a team full-time living in that country to implement those projects. Um, but before I continue explaining more about World Monuments Fund, I want to share with you four kind of important moments that really led to the creation of World Monuments Fund. And in a way, really um, laid the ground for the conservation field, the heritage preservation, the historic preservation field. Uh, there are multiple names for this field. Um, 
in the way we know it today. Uh, and the first one was in 1931, um, the Athens Charter. I don't know if you are familiar uh, with this, but in the really in the first half of the 20th century is when the our professional field really expanded and in a way established itself um, because there were a lot of questions of authenticity and questions of uh, different approaches to conservation and the restoration of monuments. There was a lot of destruction in the first half of the 20th century. And in 1931, uh, the um, Athens Charter came up. This was kind of like a, manif a seven point manifesto that was created by the um, first International Congress of Architects that gathered in, in Athens and really, in a way, again, laid the ground for uh, what was coming, what came later on in the 20th century by the, by cr the creation, the foundation of all, any other, many other organizations and also kind of international standards that everyone followed. Um, then in 1933, and let me see if I can move this a little bit in this direction here. In 1933, uh, uh, also in Athens, another group of architects uh, gathered under the uh, International Congress for Modern Architecture, led by uh, the Swiss architect Le Corbusier, uh, to really, um, again, kind of uh, expand those notions of heritage and architecture uh, that had been laid down, laid down before in 1931. So these two moments were had been very critical for kind of the field in the 20th century, but it was in 19. In 1946, when uh, after the Second World War, uh, the United Nations created UNESCO, the UN Agency uh, for Education, Scientific and Cultural Affairs. Um, this was as a response uh, to the high level of destruction that happened in Europe after the Second World War, and also in a way to create an agency that would foster kind of peace and mutual understanding and, and protect uh, monuments and sites. So this was a very important moment because it was the first time that uh, kind of um, globally, uh, they established an international governmental organization to kind of take on this mission. And actually that led uh, in 1965 to the creation of World Monuments Fund uh, uh, 19 years later which happened also in response to really severe uh, floods that happened in Venice um, that really made a retired colonel from the US Army called James A. Gray, um, to, who was already had been, work, had been uh, deployed uh, in Europe during the Second World War and was very concerned about uh, the destruction of cultural heritage around the world. And, how little or the limitations, let's say, that UNESCO had in really addressing uh, the, the preservation of cultural heritage globally, that led this retired colonel to create World Monuments Fund in 1965 to really try to help Venice uh, and the many sites that, had, that were affected by the, by the floods. And in my opinion, I feel that this is a very kind of uh, very American uh, entrepreneur, entrepreneurial kind of approach uh, that rather than waiting for the government to do something, which in my opinion is something that perhaps Europeans would do more, uh, this person decided to create an organization in the US and try to raise private funding to bring to, in this case, Venice and help really fill the gaps, fill the needs that UNESCO wasn't able to do. So uh, that was a, a huge effort for World Monuments Fund. Back then, the organization was called the International Fund for Monuments, and it helped restore a lot of sites that were damaged by the floods. It also helped establish uh, a research and scientific and technical lab in Venice to really help in all the kind of scientific and technical questions about the conservation of materials and sites, um, and also the publication of many um, uh, publications and reports and conferences uh, to really disseminate knowledge. Um, and that led to our kind of second project uh, in the late 1960s um, 
in the island of Easter Island, in Rapa Nui, in Chile. Um, at that point, the International Fund for Monuments, uh, led by uh, Colonel Gray, was also very, were also very concerned about the uh, lack of conservation of the Moai structures uh, that were um, really lacking proper conservation, maintenance, uh, scientific research, documentation, and resources to really locally, uh, to really undertake conservation projects uh, to preserve this very important heritage that I'm sure you all have seen, at least in photographs. Um, so to really help uh, Rapa Nui and raise awareness and raise funds, the International Fund for Monuments that became World Monument Fund a few years later, did a, something that today would be a crazy idea, which is to bring one of the Moai uh, Moai uh, statues to Park Avenue in October 9, of 1968. It was put on a plane and brought to uh, Park Avenue and, and installed on top of a pedestal in front of the Seagram building to, uh, as part of a campaign to raise awareness about the needs uh, for preservation support and funding in Rapa Nui to help uh, kind of conserve this very important heritage. And that in fact was very successful because that led to many uh, conservation missions and research and documentation and management plans and maintenance plans for the, for the site that uh, World Monuments Fund led for more than a decade. And these are just some covers of some of those reports. And then after that, um, after the installation of, after having the, the MOA um, uh, statue installed in Park Avenue for a month, it, and you can see some of the photographs here, uh, which I, I believe is very impressive and something that we would never do today uh, to contextualize, you know, a type of uh, a statue like this and bring it thousands of miles away to New, all the way to New York. But again, it was a successful case back then. Uh, but after that, it was returned to Rapa Nui. And, and in fact, as I said, World Monuments Fund worked for a long time supporting uh, local professionals and authorities in the preservation in the preservation of Rapa Nui and the development of uh, really standards and conservation guidelines for, for the proper maintenance of the local heritage there. Uh, this is just a timeline that shows an overview of our history, you know, as an organization created in 1965, as I said before, and then you can see here some of our kind of key projects, uh, including Rapa Nui, but also the establishment of our, some of our uh, field offices, um, the establishment of some of our key programs that I oversee, our Jewish heritage program, our modernism program, and our crisis response program, which was the latest program that we created in 2019, really in a way to respond to the, really the needs that we are facing today uh, in many parts of the world with a uh, high level of destruction of sites um, uh, as a result of climate change and, and the many natural disasters that we face constantly, but also human conflict, uh, the human conflict that we are seeing in, again, many parts of the world um, these days as well. So currently we have 51 active projects um, around the world and they really, as you can see here, uh, they really spread out around, you know, the, all, all the continents or most of the continents in the world. And uh, in 33 countries, we have 15 signature projects. That means projects that, um, that require major funding from World Monument Fund and where we've been involved for a long time, including places like, for instance, Angkor Wat in Cambodia or Rapa Nui in Chile. Uh, but also we do, um, as I said before, we cover a, a long kind of uh, spectrum of types of projects. So we also do training programs um, where we really help build capacity and educate uh, younger professionals in skills and tools of um, heritage conservation. So again, you know, we really try to address as much as possible. We always like to say that we are a small organization with a huge mission, but obviously we rely and we collaborate uh, alongside with many local partners, authorities, UNESCO in fact as well. Uh, and that is very important for us. And I put this photograph of um, Angkor here in Cambodia because 
in terms of our major projects, um, Angkor is one of the places, it's actually currently the, the place where we've been working uh, the longest. Uh, we've been working in Angkor since 1989. Uh, recently, a few years ago, we uh, celebrated our 30th anniversary um, working in Cambodia. We established an office there. There was a big need to really assess the level, the condition of uh, many of the monuments and temples in Angkor. Uh, in the late 1980s, after the country had, uh, been, had been going through a, a very strong dictatorship. And World Monuments Fund went there and still there. Um, and that's very uncommon for us. We typically go to places uh, where we are called, uh, help people, uh, finding resources, training people, um, developing conservation projects, and then develop a plan and kind of like an exit plan for us to go and for them to continue without us. It's not our goal to go to places and stay stay there for three decades. But Cambodia is in fact one of those places where we've done that. And as I was saying before, we recently celebrated our 30th anniversary. We've restored many, many monuments there. And this is uh, the, all the team that we employ there. It's just a small group of um, people who are kind of international experts, but most of the team is local. Uh, and in fact, there's already a few um, generations that we train their parents and now their children are also working at the site. So that's also a nice story. Um, and I also wanna speak about the watch because um, we work in many parts of the world as I, I'm trying to uh, show you today. And while we are always um, in many conversations with a lot of partners and organizations and governments to try to find ways to help, the main kind of channel for World Monuments Fund to engage with new sites is through our a program that we call the World Monuments Watch. This is a program that happens every two years. We open a call for nominations and we do it this way because it's really a, a way to, in a way, open a window and have asked people to bring sites to us in a kind of bottom-up way rather than us going to places and look for new projects and sites that we can support. So every two years, we open a call for nominations, um, and we've been doing that since, 19, since 1996, when the watch was created. And we receive hundreds of nominations from all over the world uh, of sites in need, uh, sites in need of help uh, that are at risk of destruction, sites where there are, there are opportunities uh, to implement projects, places where people uh, have needs for funding, to uh, support the restoration of a site or where there is a need for uh, training or just to collaborate. We receive nominations from professionals, individuals, members of the local communities, uh, municipal governments and ministries of culture, um, preservation professionals. So really, you know, it's a very diverse type of um, nominators that bring the sites to us. And as I was saying, we receive hundreds of nominations every two years. Uh, this slide that you see here is from our current watch from the moment when we opened the call for nominations for the 2022 watch, which is our current cycle that is uh, uh, currently running right now. And we only select 25 sites. So it's a very challenging and competitive process. Uh, we only select 25 sites because we want that every site, every project that we engage with, uh, we really have the capacity financially and human capacity to support our colleagues and develop a project together with them. Um, so, you know, every year we select many sites and this is these are just a kind of random selection of sites that I uh, selected for this slide, but that really represent the types of uh, projects, sites, typologies that we include we always want to make sure that this the watch serves in a way as, as a thermometer to see how the field is doing, what types of questions uh, the uh, professionals in the field are really asking. Uh, so we really we really try to 
have a group of sites that represent different typologies, different geographies, different communities and religions, uh, different problems and questions, sites that are modern, archaeological sites, ancient sites, sites affected by conflict or by natural disasters, uh, sites where there are opportunities to raise more awareness about the important stories uh, that took place in those uh, in those sites uh, to really, again, um, make sure that the, the, the watch represents the kind of diverse, uh, the diversity of the world where we live in. Um, so, you know, like, as I'm trying to kind of explain through my first slides, our work at World Monument Fund has been really, um, has, has been really addressing a lot of diverse type of sites, but mainly historically, we focused in more historic ancient places, uh, but it, it was in the 1990s, in the late 1990s, um, through the watch, in fact, that we started um, paying attention also to modern architecture, architecture of the 20th century. And this was because we were receiving a lot of submissions to the watch of sites mainly in threat that were in under a threat of demolition because as you all might know modern architecture modernist architecture tends to be um undervalued uh unprotected by kind of heritage uh, laws and in many cases a lot of sites end up being demolished and disappearing so we were facing those type of uh, type of kind of questions through many nominations in the watch. And in fact, this house that you see here was actually the first um, modernist site that World Monument Fund got involved uh, with, which is the Conger Goodyear House, a house that was built in 1938 in Long Island. And in fact, I learned recently that um, the family, it was a private house when it was built, and the family that built the house in 1970, uh, donated this house to the New York Institute of Technology. Uh, so there's a connection with this school. Uh, I, I didn't know about this, uh, that, that fact. Um, but in 1997, um, the university decided to sell the house to a developer who wanted to demolish the house and build kind of luxury uh, houses. And it was at that time, uh, a few years later, when a group of preservationists in Long Island submitted a nomination to the World Monument Watch. And it, the site was included in the watch in 2002. And it's kind of like another crazy story, similar to um, what we did with the with Easter Island, because World Monument Fund partnered with a local foundation and the Long Island Preservation, uh, a Long Island Preservation Group to buy the house. So we actually bought the house to the developer and were able to restore it. This, this photo that you see here is after the restoration, the house was in really bad conditions, uh, but we were able to restore it and find a buyer who was interested in preserving it and using it as a house. So the house is now preserved. Uh, so it's you know an interesting case study because we bought a house and that's something that we never do. We don't own sites. We only go to places to help people that reach out to us. Uh, but it's also, it was a successful story and also it was our first kind of project initiative on modern architecture. And that led us to get involved with a lot of different sites around the world. And you might know this house, this is the uh, Tugendat Villa in Brno in uh, the Czech Republic, designed by Ms. van der Rohe. Uh, this, this house during the Second World War was abandoned because the family had to... Uh, leave uh, the Czech Republic, the Europe, and uh, in the late 1990s, 1990s, World Monuments Fund also uh, got involved to really conduct a condition assessment of the house to uh, understand the kind of uh, the physical condition of the structure, of the physical fabric of the house. We work with MoMA to access to the original uh, architectural drawings that are archived here in New York. And uh, we're able to um, secure the house as a national uh, historic landmark in the Czech Republic and restored. And it's now a house that everyone can visit. And uh, actually, they open it also for um, um, scholars who conduct research and can spend time in the house as well. Um, this is another site that I also want to uh, briefly 
tell you about because they are, they are kind of like part of our history supporting modern architecture globally. This is the Miami Marine Stadium. Perhaps some of you know it. It's in Miami. It was designed by a Cuban American architect called uh, Hilario Candela in 1964. And it's another site that we also supported because the site, as you might know, has been closed and abandoned since 1992 because that year Miami uh, suffered a very strong hurricane, uh, Hurricane Andrew, that hit the Miami, hit the building, and the city, um, after the hurricane, thought that the Miami Marine Stadium was so affected by the by the hurricane that uh, it was unsafe to use it. Um, and it's been closed since then. There has been a lot of battles of preservation. It's locally uh, in Miami and we supported them because they submitted a nomination to the watch again in 2010. And through the watch, we conducted an engineering study uh, to really understand the level of damage. We resulted that the building is actually in very good conditions and uh, it's a structurally safe, let's say. It's in, not in good, in good conditions because it's been vandalized for uh, almost um, three decades. So it needs a, lo a lot of help, but it's a structurally safe. Uh, and in fact, if you ever go to Miami, I encourage you to go and see because even though it's closed, you can actually walk in the building and it's kind of like open uh, or you can just like move a fence and just walk in. I've done it and it's actually a really cool building. Uh, and then this brings me to kind of a situation that um, we encountered in 2017 uh, when we received um, a message from local architects in Delhi, in, in India, about this building. This is a building that was built in 1972 to commemorate the, um, the 25th anniversary of India's independence. Uh, uh, it's a building called the, the Hall of Nations. And uh, it was an exhibition space, a very beloved uh, type of building in the city, uh, but the government of uh, uh, Delhi uh, wanted to demolish it. So a group of architects kind of like gathered together to try to support it and come up with a plan for the future preservation of the site. We accepted to help them, uh, but in the process of uh, trying to help and articulate a project with them, the government actually demolished it overnight. Um, so that really raised uh, all the alerts in India about the importance of um, modern architecture, which is also connected to the story, the history of the post-independence period in India, um, when many, like a whole generation of uh, young architects in India created kind of a new language, a new uh, architectural language uh, that really removed India from the kind of colonial, uh, more traditional architecture that was landmarked and preserved. And since then, we've uh, been working with a lot of organizations and professionals, and I'll show you a project in a minute, uh, to really advocate for uh, the uh, to raise more awareness about the importance of modernist architecture in India, which again is not only about the architecture value but also the historical and social value that is connected to the post-independence period, and also to develop projects to actually restore and adapt these buildings to contemporary uses if some of them are aren't really uh, used uh, anymore. And so now I want to show you three projects very quickly, walk you through three projects, one in Canada, one in India, and another one in Burkina Faso that we recently completed in the last two years, uh, and that really aligned with this type of uh, vision that I was, uh, that I've been trying to kind of say throughout my presentation that, yes, we were kind of addressing problems and technical issues, but also bringing the voices of the local uh professionals and local communities who care about these buildings, who steward these buildings, and who are in need sometimes of su local support from the government, but also international support from organizations like, like us. So one of them is Ontario Place, which is uh, this incredible place that you see here. It's a, a futuristic mega structure uh, built on three artificial islands in Lake Ontario that was built in 1971 by an architect called Eberhard, Eberhard Seiler and landscape architect Michael Hoff. And it's composed by a number of structures. These are the pods, which are these incredible structures that emerge on, on the water uh, and are supported by these structural cables. 
and it was designed, this whole complex was designed in 1971, as I said, in a way as a response of the um, 1967 Montreal exhibition. So Toronto also wanted to have their own kind of moment and they built this space for kind of like uh, public access and um, multi-purpose uh, programming, and including this building, which as you can see now is abandoned, has been abandoned for since 2010. The Cinesphere, which is a cinema that is actually in use, is one of the few buildings in the complex that is uh, still in use. Uh, the villages, which are these structures that also serve multiple uh, purposes, shops, coffee shops, restaurants, uh, and also these days also um, are used by artists uh, to do installations. Uh, and then there was a children's village and a forum that were demolished uh, in the 1990s. And also the landscape, which is very important because since the beginning, Ontario Place was um, not only a place with very kind of forward looking architecture, but also with a very kind of forward looking landscape because all the landscape was designed by Michael Hoff uh, using native plants when, you know, in the 1970s wasn't really the trend. These days today is really what most of the landscape architects do, but not back in the 1970s. So really a very visionary landscape architect. And also the fact that Ontario Place is a public space, a public park that provides access to the water for local Ontarians, Torontonians, uh, to also for those who don't have access to the waterfront because they don't have a summer home. Uh, so really provides that um, that type of a space for everyone. These are just some images of um, the site under construction. Uh, in this project, the site was nominated to our 2020 watch uh, by a local organization called the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario. We selected it, it was included in the watch and we started working with them and with the School of Architecture, the Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design at the University of Toronto to develop a project that also um, conducted a lot of historical research. So that's why these historical photographs that you can see there. And just to put some more context, this is uh, downtown Toronto uh, in the circle and Ontario Place in on the three artificial islands in Lake Ontario in the waterfront of Toronto. Um, more photographs of the site, you know, as I said before, has been abandoned since 2010. So with our partners from the University of Toronto and the Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, we created, we articulated a project called the Future of Ontario Place, where we um, defined these three, these four, sorry, uh, goals to foster more uh, broad public recognition about the site because it's been and still is under threat of demolition by the provincial government of Ontario, who wants to demolish it to privatize the land, the land and build a spa, um, a private spa, to create a more productive dialogue between stakeholders. That's something that we typically do to kind of, as an international organization that is frequently seen as a more neutral organization, bring everyone together around the table to make decisions and protect sites and really foster, you know, a productive conversation between local stakeholders. Increase the thoughtful thoughtfulness among students and professionals. As I said before, we work, we worked in this project with the University of Toronto. So we engage students of architecture really on uh to really train them and and help them understand the value of heritage and the tools and methodologies to really articulate the significance of a site and really develop a conservation management plan for it. And then to change government and policy, which is our ultimate goal to protect the site and not only protect the architecture and the landscape, but also the fact that it's a public space, the publicness of the site. Uh, just the framework that we followed. Um, and I wanna show you some of the outcomes of the project because this project actually just finished last year. Um, these are some of the site analysis that were conducted by the students at the University of Toronto, where we captured all the changes over time that the site went through uh, so that we could also understand how the place has changed. Uh, because for us, uh, we don't see preservation as a way to stop change, but to manage change uh, kind of rigorously uh, and in an inclusive way. So it's important to really recognize all the changes that sites go through and embrace some of that site. So for that, it's very important to do this type of analysis. Then we did it also for the different sites. This is for the Cinesphere. You can see here the connections, the circulations, 
then a section recognizing the different elements within the scene sphere. Um, and then the same for the villages, you know, just to understand how the villages, uh, which are these structures that I said before that are multi-purpose, uh, how they are designed, how they are uh, used, uh, what type of programming they have, what is the circulation around them, and then to understand the different kind of geometries that compose those uh, structures, and then understand where they are located in each of the buildings. And then the poles, which are the most kind of impressive structures that those structures that I showed you before that are kind of on top of the water supported by those uh, uh, structural cables. Again, the programming, uh, well, it didn't include the other the other ones, but also we include circulation, another um, analysis that we did at the site. We were also very lucky to have access to the original model designed by Michael Hoff and Eb Seiler in the process. And, you know, I also want to highlight that Ontario Place uh, came to us uh, from our local partners, but really the significance is historic. One of the aspects that made Ontario Place so significant is that Ontario Place is really, really connects to all the theories um, in the architecture field of the mega structure movement, the metabolist movement, that in many ways were utopian uh, ideas that only stayed in kind of like the architectural theory world, the academic world, uh, and really helped, you know, foster a lot of creativity among architects and designers. And these are just some examples of some of those theories by Jonah Friedman. And again, some models um, of Arata Isosaki from the kind of metabolist kind of uh, group of architects. And what makes Ontario Place unique is that it's a site that actually got built following this kind of approaches about an ideas, utopic ideas of mega structures. So that is one of the main reasons why Ontario Place is significant. But then on top of that is everything else that I said before about publicness, access to the waterfront, et cetera. And in fact, you know, some of the initial sketches by Eb Seiler, the architect, always uh, showed that it was a, one, of the, one of the main design kind of ideas to really make Ontario accessible for everyone, reclaiming the shoreline for people and not for cars. Uh, these are just some photographs of the construction that I think are very interesting. Uh, when you open in the 1970s, 1980s, very active place, very again, beloved place. If you know anyone from Toronto that was born probably in the 70s and 80s knows uh, uh, Ontario place and probably have spent a lot of time there. Um, and through our work, we also conducted a, a lot of studies about how it's used today. This entire project happened during COVID, but we still uh, could see how the, the space was used to, you know, take the some uh, sun bath, uh, go for a run, go for uh, uh, biking, playing sports. You know, it's a very, again, very much used space. We also conducted a lot of interviews to key stakeholders, people who use the space, local architects, the managers of the different sites, the original managers of Ontario Place, the different sites of, at Ontario Place in back in the 1970s and 80s, uh, the family of the architect, different people who benefit and use and have something to say about the space. And I wanna, these are just some images of those, some of those interviews, but I wanna show you a small, a short clip uh, of an interview that we conducted uh, to uh, George Bird, who you might know, he's an architect, actually just passed away a couple months ago, but he was the Dean at the School of Architecture at the University of Toronto. And he also helped on this project a lot. And we recorded an interview. So I just wanna show you a short 10 second clip of that interview. So you can see the type of material that we also produced really to as part of the advocacy campaign that we developed to advocate for the preservation of the site. So let's see if this works. I don't think we can hear it. Can I do something to raise the volume here? I don't know. Because there's sound in the video. Maybe if we exit here. Oh, I try to make, make. Now? Let's see. Um, I don't hear it yet because it runs. Oh, okay. Oh, that's so sorry. too bad. No, no worries. 
Uh, this is just a short clip that really captures his interview. Um, so I'm sorry that you cannot hear it. What? Yes, well, he's only say, he's just saying, you know, what, um, why he he believes from from the architectural point of view, uh, Ontario Place was, was such a significant place, uh, very avant garde in his time, and that Toronto, the, the Ontario government should preserve it. So the interview was much longer, but this is just a fragment of it that was used in the campaign that we developed, the advocacy campaign that we developed with our colleagues in Ontario. Uh, this is the logo of the project and you know the different partners. Uh, we also did um, a call for counter proposals where you know our main partner was the University of Toronto, but we engaged all the schools of architecture in Canada, bring asking uh, students of architecture, landscape architecture, urban design, and urban planning to bring ideas uh, to redevelop Ontario Place while preserving. Uh, what really makes the site very significant, its landscape, its architecture, and its publicness. Um, we created in the platform, we created a platform online called Future of Ontario Place. So if you want to actually see the video that I wanted to show you, you can go there, uh, where we also capture all the research, all the site analysis, all the, we created a timeline where you can see kind of the history of Ontario Place. And also we gathered a lot of material that was online in one place. Um, and now very quickly, I'm just realizing that I only have five minutes, but I have two more projects to uh, tell you, uh, to show you. So I'll try to go fast. Um, as I was saying before, we are, okay. We, <laughs> as I was saying before, we, um, we are very interested in, you know, through our work, foster or bring the kind of like the social, meaning and dimension of why these places that where we work are significant. We also have a responsibility to really make sure that we work uh, in a way that embraces, that engages with sites that really expand the narrative of what heritage is, and in this case, what modern heritage is. Uh, as I showed you before, you know, uh, we've worked at sites this the Conger Goodyear House in Long Island, the Miami Marine Stadium in, in Florida, uh, the Tugendhat Villa in the Czech Republic. We've worked in other sites in Western Europe, but recently we've been trying to um, also put the spotlight uh, on modern architecture in countries of the global South because they are facing um, demolition, some of them, and I show you the images of the whole of nations in Delhi. Um, so there is really a need to advocate for, well, when the local people, the local professionals want to preserve these sites to really help them in that mission. But there is also a need for to bring training and education about how to preserve modern architecture globally, and also to expand the narrative about modern architecture that is not only about the Bauhaus and Le Corbusier and Frank Lloyd Wright and all the architects in that were very active in Western Europe and the US, but also architects in India, in African countries that really contributed to the modern movement more globally and also embraced the modernist kind of ideology to create a new language, a new architectural language in their countries that countries that actually faced a post-independence period after the colonial times. So India is one of those. The whole of nations, the example that I showed you before is a very important case study, but recently we also engaged this stadium that you see here. This is a cricket stadium in the city of Ahmedabad in Gujarat in India. It's called the Sardar Vallabhai Patel Stadium. It's a building that was designed by two major figures in India, Charles Correa uh, on the left hand uh, side of the photograph. He was a major uh, modernist architect in India. And Mahindra Raj, who was the engineer uh, here on the right side of the of the slide. Both of them collaborated in the design and construction of the Patel Stadium in Ahmedabad. And the site uh, was nominated to the 2020 watch. Um, again, a very competitive process, but we included it in, in, the, in the program because there is a need for conservation. The site, the building was built in 1965 and it's never been really re properly restored. Um, 
it was created, it was built to be a, a major cricket stadium in India, but in the 1980s, the government of Ahmedabad built a bigger stadium outside the city. So the Patel Stadium became in a way uh, only used for local cricket matches, but also became um, an important space for the city uh, because it provides open public space for uh, the citizens of Ahmedabad, which as you can see in a very dense encroached city, having access to public space, like the one that provides the Patel Stadium, not only through the uh, cricket ground, but also the areas surrounding, uh, which are part of the site. Uh, it was very important for, it's been very important for the local uh, citizens of Ahmedabad to go, use the space to practice yoga, to go for a walk, for women to uh, meet there in one of the few green spaces uh, that is relatively safe in the city. So we included the, uh, the site in the watch to help local efforts to preserve the site and embrace some of these new uses that go beyond cricket uh, through the development of a conservation management plan. And we actually did that with in collaboration with the Ahmedabad Municipal Corporation, which is the um, municipal government that manages and runs the, the site, but also with the support from the Getty Foundation in California. And the project, the process to develop a conservation management plan was really exciting because it gave us the opportunity to access all the original drawings uh, and models and construction documents from the Charles Correa Foundation and the uh, Mahindra Rush archives. These are just some images of those. And that was very important, first of all, to articulate the significance, as I said also before in the previous examples, but also to understand how the building was built what type of concrete they used so that we could also understand the pathologies the, the building faces today and how to intervene those. Um, and then it gave us the opportunity, this process, to engage with many different types of stakeholders from the cricketers to the people who use the space to practice yoga, as I said before, uh, schools, local schools who use the space as the only kind of open space they have uh, during the breaks. Uh, so they bring the students to the to the, uh, the the area. So to really engage all of them um, in consultation kind of meetings to understand what they like about the site, how they use it, what aspirations they have about it, and how they think it could be improved. And that is important to, again, include those voices in the kind of conservation planning process, but also to inform that process so that it's not us saying how the site needs to be redeveloped or redesigned, but also, you know, it's actually the, the local people who are telling, kind of informing those decisions. And these are some of the interviews that we conducted to the cricketers, the first cricketers who, who use the space, uh, or some of uh, some of the first ones. Uh, many of the kind of local professionals, engineers and architects that we interviewed and that were part of the process in Ahmedabad uh, and other parts of India, this process, this project happened during COVID also. So it was a very challenging process, but also gave us the opportunity to do everything over Zoom and really engage a lot of international professionals that otherwise we couldn't have brought to India, uh, but also to gather them with local professionals over Zoom through a series of workshops about the significance of the site, the conservation of concrete, et cetera, et cetera. And these are just some of the uh, meetings that we had with the local authorities. And this is actually the entire team of um, colleagues who participated in the project from the Charles Correa Foundation, the Rahul Merotra worked on the design, World Monuments Fund kind of uh, facilitated and, and led the whole process. And now I'm gonna tell you about our last project very quickly. This is a project that is actually uh, only starting right now. And it's a site called the Maison du Pop in the city of Ouagadougou, the capital of Burkina Faso. It's a site that was designed in the late 1960s by an architect called René Foblet. Right after Burkina Faso became independent from France. And it's, again, another building that is part of kind of like a collection of buildings that were built in this post-independence period. Uh, really embracing the ideals and the design uh, and the materials of the modern movement. It's a building designed fully in reinforced concrete. And it was built to become the headquarters of the main political party 
in Burkina Faso after independence. And then it was transformed into kind of like a conference exhibition center later on. And it's a site that was also nominated to the 2022 watch. So it's in our current cycle. And we selected it because we realized that there are a lot of buildings like this in Africa that are under-recognized, that the contribution of um, African modernist architects isn't properly recognized at the global level in the same way as, you know, as I was saying before, other kind of European and American architects are. And also there is a need for preserving the sites and also to um, uh, train local, you know, architects on the kind of methods and tools to preserve the sites. The site is uh, here, it's in the middle of Ouagadougou uh, and also a very uh, dynamic part of uh, the city and has a big uh, open space around it, which also is a great opportunity. And what is important is I'm just gonna show we show you today is again, this is a very in a very early stage, but I wanna show you kind of the process of how we are envisioning this project. So we, the process, the, the kind of, main objectives for the project is to develop an, a training program that would train local students of architecture and engineer on conservation skills, then to conduct a condition assessment with them so that they understand the type of field work and the type of documentation that it takes for a site like this uh, to be properly assessed and really to develop a study on the condition, the structural condition of the site. And third, to disseminate the entire project from beginning to end and ultimately at the end through a series of activities to also be transparent, but, uh, but also to, um, to make sure that we raise awareness about the architectural, social, historical importance of the site um, in the world. So in terms of the activities, these four objectives, sorry, these three objectives will be articulated through four activities. First, to recover the site's history and significance by really, again, just like we did at Patel Stadium, have access to the original drawings and understand how the building was built, um, work with the local authorities, gathering all the material that exists about the building and the different changes over time that it's been going through, uh, then training on conservation of concrete architecture, younger architects and engineers, who will also be part of the condition assessment and the development of a conservation management plan. So it gives us the opportunity to use the building as a case study and also really um, meet our mission, our educational mission, really bringing everyone together around this project. And finally, to disseminate the entire project as I uh, kind of in a way as we did with Ontario Place through a digital archive and an exhibition that we hope to show in Ouagadougou, but also in other um, universities in West Africa, where we are also working, so that it really brings more attention in the continent about this building and contextualizes it with other buildings uh, in, in nearby countries. I don't think this is gonna work, the sound, but I'm just gonna play this video and I will just speak as uh, the video moves. Um, we are only starting this project. We've been spending a lot of time really planning all the kind of activities and outcomes and objectives, but we've already done a little bit of work engaging different local people, authorities and professionals. So this video just encapsulates um, some of that work, uh, some of the first interviews that we conducted just a couple months ago um, through our consultants who one is based in Morocco and the other one is based in Ouagadougou to again, really bring the voices of the local people who care about this building, who are stewarded and who will um, work on the preservation uh, to the forefront so that it's not again us just saying why this place is important and how it's it has to be, it, it, it needs to be restored, but the local professionals and local authorities uh, and also to really inform our Kind of planning process because they are the ones who will tell us how the space can be used uh, if we develop an adaptive reuse plan, uh, the problems the building is facing currently in terms of the 
materials, but also in terms of the use of the different uh, rooms in the space and also their surrounding area. So these are just some images of kind of that process of how we engage with people and then, you know, try to put together kind of compelling uh, videos that unfortunately you cannot hear uh, so that it's, it, this can also be used as a tool to raise awareness about the importance of buildings like these uh, coming directly from, you know, the local, the local voices. And then as part of, you know, the activities that we are planning uh, to work with the local schools and, and engage, you know, a very diverse group of stakeholders, we are developing a series of tools. And I just wanna show you some of the kind of drafts, in fact, that we are developing, you know, to really uh, engage people in a kind of compelling and fun way through kind of like this type of cards that we are preparing that will be translated into English, um, French, and one of the local languages. Uh, so this is, again, just a draft, and you will see that, in fact, two of the languages here, like English is repeated two times, um, but just to, you know, these are the tools that we are developing really to um, engage with people who aren't really familiar with modern architecture by really connecting sites like the Maison du Pop with other elements that they might recognize more quickly uh, as, as local heritage, and also to contextualize the site and the architect, René Foblet, within a larger kind of constellation of modern sites in Burkina Faso and countries in Western Africa, and also with architects that are better known regionally, um, so that again, we can, people can really relate why this site is important because it's part of a bigger kind of uh, portfolio, let's say, of sites of importance nearby. And with that, Thank you so much, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Wonderful. Okay. Javier, thank you so much. This was a great, great lecture, and uh, I very much in line with what we're trying to do in the history and theory. Uh, of uh, architecture and design uh, courses, which is open up uh, to uh, global, the global world, I mean, the globe in general, the world and the architecture that has been produced uh, throughout, uh, you know, in many countries, even in the global south that has been overlooked by architectural historians until today. Uh, and I have the feeling also that uh, what uh, you explained to us today, come over, come in the middle, what you explained to us today um, somehow touches upon some of the methodologies um, that we are trying to um, apply as architectural historians and educators uh, to the, in universities, which are, for instance, I'm thinking about post-colonial theory and how that is informing our new um, approaches to architectural history. And that is precisely what we're doing with uh, uh, the history and theory teaching cohort uh, here at NYIT. Uh, so we thank you so much for uh, showing uh, uh, everybody, showing us, showing the students how uh, these theories, these approaches that have more of a sensitivity towards uh, differences across the globe uh, can be applied in um, you know, in in real real world, uh, through in this case preservation, conservation, activism, and so on and so forth. Um, I want to check. We don't have much time, so uh, we might just uh, get one question from the students if they have, or uh, I can ask one or uh, colleagues that are here. Uh, any question? Yes, we have a couple of questions. Uh, let's see whether we can uh, get both. Try to syn synthesize, guys. Uh, good afternoon. I was wondering, organizations like the WMF and conservation organizations, how does like one get into them? Because obviously you need specialists who understand the cultural perspectives and engineers who know how to examine a site. But, like what mm -hmm. qualifications do you need to um, enter a web, um, an organization like this? Yes. So, you know, World Monument Fund as a nonprofit organization has a very diverse um team because there is a team that falls under the programs department which is where i work and in that department you know that's where we oversee our programs projects initiatives and i would say to work with in that kind of area within the organization 
everyone that is part of my team has either a background in architecture, urban planning, archaeology, art history, and most of us um, have a master's in uh, historic preservation or critical conservation in my case, um, that really kind of unifies the, the, the other very diverse backgrounds on archaeology, architecture, urban planning, etc. So I think, or engineering as well. Um, so I think that's kind of a very, um, something that is shared in that kind of that, that team. But obviously then there are other teams in the organization as a nonprofit organization. And this is something that I kind of discovered when I started working in the US because, you know, as, uh, as an architect from Spain, I wasn't really familiar about how nonprofits work, but obviously we have other types of skills and kind of backgrounds in the team people who work in fundraising and um, really to make sure that we get funding from bigger foundations, from governments, from individuals to really continue our mission. We have a department of communications uh, who is really kind of our public face. And while these kind of two other groups have different types of backgrounds in kind of fundraising, communications, marketing, et cetera, it's always important to have people with a back, with some knowledge or some understanding on architecture, history, and preservation in those teams as well, because that's our mission. That's our our core mission. So, um, some of those members of the team also have some of that type of knowledge. But in you know to really kind of do the work work that I do, um, I think really having experience or studies in architecture preservation. Heritage studies is very key to really be able to know how to implement these projects, engage um, with local professionals and partners, and really kind of advance the, our mission in the organization. And then there's a lot of things that you learn in the way, because, you know, like I do a lot of work that relates in many ways to kind of diplomacy, but I'm an architect, but, you know, like we're always engaging with U.S. embassies in the countries where we work, because even though we are an international organization, we are based in the US. So we respond to kind of US law. And it's important that every where where we work, we have a strong relationship with the US embassy. We have a strong relate, we, we build a strong relationships with ministries of culture. Uh in a few days, I'm going to Morocco for a project that we are trying to do, for instance, there for um as a response to the earthquake that happened in Morocco in last September, you might remember in Marrakesh. And I will be meeting with people from the Ministry of Islamic Affairs, the Ministry of Culture, the U.S. Embassy, U.N. Habitat. So you kind of like end up developing these other kind of more diplomatic skills that aren't really part of your architecture background, but that are really important for an organization like this. Uh, the, the question and quickly answer. <laughs> um, so one of your uh, slides said that um, one of your targets is changing government policy. So how is that possible? If yes. you could elaborate on that. Yes. Thank you. That is uh, probably that was under the project of Ontario Place. You know, there are many ways, many, many projects, many, many initiatives that we do where we work directly with the governments and the governments really believe in the kind of power of preservation and cultural heritage. Um, but in other occasions, an Ontario Place is one of those the government wants to demolish the site. Uh, so we partner with local professionals from Architectural Conservancy of Ontario in that case, and the local school of architecture at the University of Toronto to advocate for the preservation. So in that case, we're actually fighting against the government. So how do we do that? I mean, through multiple uh, ways, there isn't really a magic formula, unfortunately, but we, we run advocacy campaigns, we do public programs, we we try to facilitate um, consultation meetings where all the kind of key stakeholders are represented, meaning the civil society, people who care about these places, but also local architects and professionals, organizations that have been advocating already before we arrived for the preservation of those sites, and also the local authorities who have something to say on the site, meaning the municipal government, Ministry of Culture, provincial government, whatever it is in every country, but to really facilitate those conversations. Sometimes we are successful, sometimes we are not. But typically, you know, we when we are reached in those type of situations is because 
the local preservationists aren't successful and aren't being heard by the local government. And they need an international, more neutral organization to kind of advocate and facilitate those conversations. And that's what, we, what we've been doing in many cases, and Ontario Place is one of them. We are still fighting there. I mean, our partners are fighting and we are supporting them um, to really, you know, uh, preserve the site. So all this to say that, you know, advocacy, um, meetings with local key stakeholders, public programs, public consultation is key in to achieve that goal. Well, that's great. I think it concludes very well this lecture. And what's, I want to say that just a few shortcomings from today's uh, conversation. These are first year students, so they're learning uh, as we progress about the, the, the various uh, uh, professional outputs after the graduation. Uh, but I think what we really uh, realized is the importance of community engagement. And that relates so much with the fact that you're dealing with heritage. And of course, architecture was built in the past that has some some significance. So we've been discussing in class about the importance of connecting with uh, the users, the people that live in the area in which we are uh, operating as designers. So I think that uh, Javier's uh, presentation illustrates precisely the strength of collaboration with local communities, but also um, engagement with the local knowledge, uh, which is such an important component of the profession as architect, regardless of, of the uh, professional output that we choose uh, for ourselves. So thank you so much, uh, Javier Osin, for being uh, here with us today. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you.